Thank you, Tom and worship team. What a great reminder that we are here to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he is and we are not. And what a declaration that is as we commit our time to the Lord in his honor and his glory because of the cross. As the children are being released from their classes this morning, it is, is great to see each and every one this morning. I'm going to pass around the guest list there if it's your first time or if there's any information that you'd like to communicate. Feel free to jot it in there uh, because we will check that um, and then we'll be able to take care of whatever is needed. But more importantly, it'd be great to connect with you as individuals coming to be a part of the body of Christ. We're going to do a little bit differently this morning now because we don't have the outside area there to worry about. So I'm simply going to give it to the gouges to start us off. It'll go down here and then just up this side. And this side is just all on your own for one. to read each and everything that is in there. We're seeking to put important things in there that the church family needs to know throughout the week. There's a number of great things in there. I do would like to highlight one of them at the very bottom there that uh, church family, we have a problem. Yes, we do have a problem, but it is a good one. <laughs> it is a good one. Um, parking. Uh, we would like to encourage you for a while. We weren't as concerned about that because of a lot of different various reasons, but um, now we're finding out that our parking lot is starting to fill up. And more importantly than everything else, it's starting to fill up so that those who need to park in the lot as close as possible, um, we're running out of spaces for them. So if you are able, we would ask that you would please choose one of the other areas of parking. It can be over behind the opera house. It can be in the... Um, post office, as long as you're against the gas station side, don't park over where the trucks are and stuff, because uh, now that packaging is becoming a big thing, Amazon is running the post office on Sunday mornings. So we do have to pay, park over on this side. Um, where are we? This side here. And then also over in Basil's. Now, I've been told that Basil's is not open on Sundays, so that gives us a little bit more room across there, so right across the street here at um, Basil's parking lot, we're free to park there. So if you could do that, please, if you're able, drop off people and then go park and then come back, then that would greatly help some of the folks that really need to be in the parking lot so that they're closer to that. So if you would just take heed on that, that would be wonderful. Again, read the announcements that are in the bulletin. There's a lot of good information for that. Um, this morning, I'm really excited to uh, have if we can change that over now, that would be great. Yes, to have Dave Ogren here this morning. Um, perhaps you haven't met him. Um, I came in contact with Dave through Gordy Wells um, some 15 years ago we were talking about because he was actually here sharing with the youth group, uh, the ministry that he's been involved in. It's a fascinating ministry, an exciting ministry, um, and that he'll be talking about even further as he's with us. Not only will he be here bringing the message to us, the challenge from God's word, but he will also be here for the Sunday school hour, for question and answer, and for more informal interaction, especially with the ministry that uh, GCMMM has in Ukraine that we've been diligently praying for and bringing before the Lord, especially with the way things have really stepped up against the Ukrainian people. So we're really excited about that. Just two quick things out on the table in the back. There's a newsletter letter. Please feel free to grab one. And also an opportunity for you to sign up if you would like to receive this newsletter to keep abreast of the ministry that they have there. And then one final thing is, is I want to encourage you, if you feel led of the Lord, grab one of the envelopes in front of the offering box. Write GCMM on the envelope itself. If there's anything that the Lord is leading on your heart that you would like to personally be a part of in this ministry, and then we will take care of getting it to them um, like that. So if the Lord is leading in that way, I would encourage you in that, in the envelopes that are out there. So Dave, please come and challenge us with the word of God and with what God is doing in and through you over these many years. Thank you, Thank you Pastor. God bless you. You too. Amen. 
Yeah, well, good morning, everybody. Um, this is my first time here, so <clears throat> just a little introduction um, that I normally don't do. Um, but uh, uh, I am married, been married 50 years. Uh, got married when I was about five years old. No, not really. <laughs> so I got three kids, five grandkids. Um, Colleen and I pastored for 35 years, and about 15 years ago, I started with this ministry, Great Commission Media Ministries. It's not a U.S.-based ministry. It's based in Finland. Uh, I'm the only guy in the U.S. I've got a big title, a U.S. Missions Director of Great Commission Media Ministries, uh, but I'm the only guy in, in the U.S. So I've got an administrative assistant in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. I live in Seattle, I travel full-time for the ministry, so I'm in a different church every Sunday somewhere, and uh, honored, thank you, Pastor, for uh, inviting me to come and, and for being here. So, Great Commission Media Ministries, what do we do? I'll, I'll share very briefly, and we can talk more about, about it in the Sunday School Hour. Um, Great, Great Commission Media Ministries is a ministry that does two major things. We do... Um, we do satellite broadcasting out of studios in Finland. So we have television studios, state-of-the-art television studios in Finland. And every day, five days a week, we're doing programming in Arabic, Farsi, which is the language of Iran, uh, Amharic, um, Somalian, Eritrean, um, and, and Sudanese. And so basically what we do is we, we bring people from all over Europe who who speak those languages as a first language. They come in, they preach, they teach, they do music. We uplink those to 18 satellite networks that it, that's targeting only one area of the world. That's the Middle East, from Morocco to Pakistan. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, w there's, there's one of the channels uh, is a Christian channel called Sat7. The rest are all uh, secular channels on purpose, because we're trying to reach people that don't know Jesus, and so we, we, we go on television every day, every day. We do a thousand programs a year. We get 200 to 300,000 responses a month, not, not people that are watching our program, but actually responding to our program every month from Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, all over the Middle East. Um, so what do we do with that? Well, we got, we got an office in Egypt that, that the U.S. side of the ministry pays for, 18 full-time workers, and then they have a whole team of volunteers, um, and they do all the follow-up of all these people that are responding to our ministry every month, every month, every month. It's a marvelous outreach. We're seeing people who, who, who've had dream encounters with Jesus, who are coming to Christ, with people who are interested in our ministry, so we have all kinds of people who are responding to our ministry, and uh, just very grateful for that. The other part of our ministry that I want to talk about this morning is our media evangelism campaigns that we do <clears throat> uh, basically all over the world. We've done 105 cities all over the world, uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, 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 we've done outreaches into Iraq, into, into Beirut, Lebanon, uh, Israel, uh, just all over the world. And, and we'll talk more about that during Sunday school. But basically, um, just before COVID, we, we did an outreach in, in uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, in East Africa. And uh, it's very typical to what we do. We, we gather churches together, cross-denominationally. They make a list of 20 to 30 of the best life stories from their culture. We do 25-minute life story documentaries on each one of those people's lives, camera ready for television. We purchase television time on, television, on, on secular television and radio, not at 3 o'clock in the morning, but primetime television. And so every night, every night, every night, there's a life story on television from their culture, in their language, simply proclaiming the power of the gospel through someone's testimony. There's no preaching. There's no plea for money. Our name is nowhere. It's just a life story on television with a website and a phone number at the bottom. The phone number is connected to a call center. We, we, um, we actually uh, staff that call center with, with local people that are trained how to answer phones, how to respond to people, how to pray with people over the phone. They take down their information. 
And then we print a book, and I'll show the book during Sunday school. We print a book um, for every city that we do, uh, obviously in their language, with, with about 10 of the testimonies in the book, uh, and then very simple evangelism, discipleship materials. And so everyone who calls into the call center is followed up live by someone from a local church who's from their part of the city who actually hand delivers the book, the goal to develop relationship with that family and to lead them to Christ. And we see thousands and thousands of people come to Christ. We had 143,000 people call into our call center in, um, in Dar es Salaam. Very, very typical to what we see in major cities all over the world. And uh, uh, all followed up by a thousand churches in the, in the Dar es Salaam region. So very, very grateful for that. So, <clears throat> okay, so COVID, COVID begins to drop. We planned Ukraine uh, long before, couldn't do it, couldn't do it because of COVID, but then all of a sudden, doors began to open for us to begin our outreach to Ukraine. And so we started that in December. And, and actually in December, we, we started in Mariupol. Most of, her, of you have heard of Mariupol, which is the main city that was destroyed by the Russians early on in the war. Um, uh, and, and, and that was our call center city. Uh, for the month of December. And we actually did what we n never have done before. We did four cities all at once. So we did Mariupol, we did Sravodovsk, we did Kr Kramatorsk, and Donetsk. And some of you have heard probably all of those names now. And so we, we did all those four cities at the same time in December. Hanu Halka, the founder of our ministry, said we can't stop. We've got to continue. The war is going to be starting here shortly. And so because of that, we did four more cities in Ukraine, all at the same time, Kharkiv, Odessa, Dnepro, and Lviv. And then, then he said, February comes, the war is almost going to begin, and so we went on national television, one plus one, for the whole month of February, as long as we could do television in the month of February. And, 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 and so all of this programming was going on, going on, going on, until we couldn't do it anymore once the war began. Hanu said, uh, we can't leave because the need is so great. We've never done significant humanitarian aid before. That, that has never been a part of our outreach, our ministry, as a primary emphasis of our ministry. But now, all of a sudden, in Ukraine, we are doing significant Ukraine um, humanitarian aid. And so basically what we're doing is we, we purchased two uh, Sprinter vans, used Sprinter vans in, 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 in Finland, drove them to, uh, through, through Poland to Ukraine, uh, loaded them with water and food and medical supplies and brought them into Ukraine. We worked strategically with the Ukrainian chaplains in the Ukrainian army, and so we already had connection on the ground. And so, and so all of our supplies that, 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 that's going in now uh, is, is actually uh, strategically placed exactly where it needs to go. So now, now we have 20 of these vans that we're using. We're bringing food, water, medical supplies in, and we've now brought thousands of women and children out through our vans. Um, we also now are having semi-loads of food and water and medical supplies that are also coming in at the same time. None of this stuff sits in a warehouse for months and months and months. It goes out almost immediately directly to uh, especially the Eastern Front where where the villages and the towns in that area really don't have anything. They don't have water, they don't have food, they don't have, have, have electricity, uh, nothing. And so uh, we're kind of the first line of defense and very grateful. So uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a little three-minute video. Uh, Hanu Hauka is the one that's doing the interviewing. You'll see who he's interviewing. There's two major guys there. Uh, that you see Albert is one of the human, of, of, of the Ukrainian chaplains that's working with us. The other one is, is Gennady. Gennady is the one that you'll see most of. His, um, he, he's also a chaplain. Uh, he, he was pastoring as well in Mariupol. And uh, uh, he had 25 uh, adopted children that are all raised now. Um, most of them were boys, and so they're all in the army, now serving in the army. His one daughter was actually killed in a, in a missile attack to one of the apartment complexes in, in Ukraine. And so he knows personally the pain and the loss of what's happening, which is horrific in Ukraine right now. And, uh, 
So uh, you'll, you'll also see uh, in one picture with, with a tank, uh, Hanu Hauka and one other man. That man, is, his name is Yuri. Uh, he pastors a very large church in Kiev, uh, about a 6,000-member church, and, and he coordinated all of our media campaigns all throughout Ukraine. So we'll show the video, and then, and then I'll come back and preach. Thank you. Weekly, he is spearheading our outreach there, and uh, he's he's embedded with the with the army often often, and um, um, we're just grateful that we can we can have a small part. There's many many wonderful ministries uh, that are involved now in Ukraine, and uh, we're just one of many. So we're, we're grateful to be able to do what we can. All right, Second Corinthians chapter four this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 7. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, <clears throat> but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus 
so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart. But though our outward man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. I pray that God as we just take a few minutes in your word this morning, that you will, you will speak to us by your word and by your spirit today. I thank you for this church. I thank you, what you for what you have in store for this church in this community. I pray blessing upon them in the name of Jesus. And I pray that God, this message today would be of, of strength and encouragement and blessing in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. And so here, Paul begins in this portion of Scripture that I just started reading in verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. So, so Paul is literally saying we're all basically jars of clay. Some of us would say we're all a bunch of crackpots, right? I mean, that's, that's the reality. But, but how, how many recognize uh, life is short, huh? Yeah, uh, no matter how long we live, I, I'm an old dog, I'm 73 years old, uh, but, um, but the years pass quickly, don't they? <laughs> it's, just, it's just amazing. Scripture's clear, James chapter 4, what is your life? James said, it is a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Psalm 39, Lord, make me to know my end. It's fleeting. It's like breath. That's here for a little while and then goes away. Isaiah 40, all flesh is like grass, like the flower of the field. So, so Paul says we need to have this awareness. We are jars of clay. We are, we are here only for a short period of time, knowing that. And, and, and all, of this, all of this is to show what? The surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And so... He goes on to talk about the human reality. We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. There's, there's lots of questions in life, lots of mystery in life. We're persecuted, he says, but not forsaken. In fact, through the scripture, you'll see in the New Testament this marvelous connection between revival and persecution. They seem to go hand in hand. So if you want to see God move, you might see some persecution too. So they, they kind of always, all, always seem to go together. Persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down but not destroyed. And then he says, we don't lose heart. Though the outward is wasting away. Since the outward is wasting away. How is this possible? How is it possible that, that we don't lose heart in the midst of, of, of life that continues to change and oftentimes can be difficult? Well, it gives us two reasons. The first one is in verse 16. He says, Where our, what, while our inner self is being renewed day by day. New life. New strength. Renewed how often? How often? Day by day. Not, not Sunday by Sunday, but day by day. So, so, so you need more than Sunday, don't you? You need the Word more than you do on Sunday. You need prayer more than you do simply on Sunday. You know, I mean, we had prayer this morning. We had worship this morning. It was wonderful. And, and, and it builds us up and it strengthens us. But you need that every day. You need the presence of God in your life every day. You need to allow God to speak. Jesus tells us in John chapter 10, my sheep what? Hear my voice. So he wants you, so, so prayer isn't just giving your grocery list to God, telling God what you need. Prayer is as well listening, getting quiet, letting God speak to you. I have found that using the Lord's Prayer in my life of late has been very, very meaningful, just slowly walking through the Lord's Prayer. My Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive my sin as I forgive those who sin against me. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. So all of that, what does it do? By, by, by prayer, by scripture, by meditation, what happens? It, 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 it strengthens us. It encourages us. It, it, gives us it, it gives us equilibrium in the midst of difficult times. And we cannot live victoriously without it. You and I need the presence of God in our life every day. And so he, he, he talks about, in verse 17... He says, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all, all compre- comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So here he says, light momentary affliction is preparing something for us. Difficult times in our life. How many have had difficult times? A couple? One? Two? Well, a couple of you raise your hand. The rest of you are lying. We've all had difficult times. <laughs> it's the reality of life. All right. So, so light, more momentary affliction is a reality. But what is it doing? It, it's it's rendering us fit for something. It's preparing us for something. It's working something out in our life. Eternal weight of glory that is beyond all com- comparison. Okay. Uh, so, so, so. What, what happens in my life and your life? Light momentary affliction causes us to shift our, atten- our attention from the temporal to the eternal, from the seen to the unseen, from, from the earthly to the heavenly, from the horizontal to the, vi- to the vertical, okay? Now, we live in two realms at the same time. How many are living here on planet Earth right now? Huh? Yeah. Uh, you got a pulse? How many got a pulse? Got a pulse? All right. So if you got a pulse, you're still with us, which is a wonderful thing. All right. So we, we live in a horizontal world, right? We, we live here, but we also live vertically at the same time. Now, now, my problem, and probably your problem, is that I get sucked into the horizontal Hmm? Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm in Barry, Vermont. So, so you must, do you guys, do you guys follow New England? Patriots? Are, are you Patriots fans here? <laughs> Giants? No. Jets? No. Okay, okay. Well, well, whatever. All right. You know, <laughs> I love sports. I'm from Seattle, so I'm, I'm, I'm a Seahawk fan. I'm a Kansas City fan because I got one son in Kansas City and I got one fun, son, son in Wisconsin. But we're all Vikings fans, so I mean, there you go. So you know, so so we can we can all get sucked into the temporary, huh? We can all get sucked into the horizontal of life, and 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 I get consumed by that. Now now the Lord's prayer is a combination of of horizontal and vertical. But, but I'm thankful for the vertical part of the Lord's Prayer where, where I'm reminded every day, your kingdom come. So every day I try to remind myself, I'm not just living here, I'm living for eternity. Jesus, how many know Jesus is coming again? Huh? You believe that? Yeah, amen. So, so, so Jesus is coming again. But, but I, need to, I need to remind myself every day of that. I, I want the coming of Christ to color my world every day. I want it to impact how I live, what I do, how I relate. Okay? So, so the coming of Christ is very important. But it's interesting that the Lord's Prayer not, not only focuses on the vertical, it also focuses on the horizontal. Give us this day our daily bread. Huh? Forgive my sin. Don't lead me into temptation. All, all that is horizontal. Or is that, all, all that is here. But it's also the vertical emphasis of the Lord's Prayer that also brings me in. And so, and, and so Paul has, says here, we, we, we don't lose hope while we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen, because the things that are seen are temporary. While we look, the word look is the word scopio in the Greek, which is where we get the term for rifle scope. And so, 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 so what does that mean? It, it, it means you, you give your attention 
to the things that are eternal, not just the things that are temporary. Okay? And we all need to do that. And it, it's very intentional. You have to give your attention to the things eternal. It's as natural as breathing to give your attention to the horizontal. You know, but it's only by intention that I give my intention, my, my attention <laughs> to, the, to the eternal or the vertical. And so we need these two things. We need daily renewal, but we need also to regularly focus on the right stuff on a regular basis. And that is why Mary, when the angel Gabriel came to her as a young lady, she was able to make the right decision because she wasn't focusing just on the temporal. She says, let it be to me according to your word. How in the world could she do that knowing what it was going to cost her, knowing the price she was going to have to pay? Nobody would understand this. She was a, she was a virgin young lady, had never been married, and here she was going to have a baby. Okay, without explanation. All right. She was going to have to pay the price for that, and she did, and so did Joseph. And you all, you all know that story. Now, let me, let me talk to you briefly about John the Baptist. Miraculous birth, okay? To Zachariah and, and Elizabeth, Luke chapter 1. Jesus said that he was the last of the Old Testament prophets in, Malachi, in, in, in Matthew chapter 11. So here, here this young man in his early 30s bursts on the scene, comes out of the desert, probably was in, in the... the a scene movement because of what he was wearing, his, his, his clothing and, 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 and his diet, you know, uh, very unusual diet, but, but very typical for living out in the desert. Um, so, so he bursts on this scene, this, this young guy, and, and, and he's called and he, he's gifted, he's anointed, he's obedient, he's the voice of God, all right, the voice in the wilderness, Luke chapter 7, uh, crowds come to him uh, down by the Jordan to be baptized, repenting of their sin, preparing their hearts for the coming of the Messiah. Uh, some, some commentators say there was up to 20,000 people that were coming at one time. It, it, this, this was revival. This was, this was amazing. This, this was messianic expectation. This was miraculous. This was God-ordained. This was God using a young man in a powerful way. Aren't you glad that God uses young people? The older I get, uh, the more I'm grateful that God uses young people. Amen? It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And sometimes we think, well, I've got to be careful. You know, they're kind of young. You know, God, God's not afraid of young. Amen? He may be afraid of old because we get stuck in the mud. But, but he's, not, he's not afraid of young. And, and, and so here, here's this young God that's, guy, guy that's greatly used of God. Jesus comes to him to the Jordan, uh, wants to be baptized to him. G John doesn't want to baptize him. I can't, I can't do that. Uh, Jesus talks him into it. Let it be so now according to, to fulfill all righteousness. And so John baptizes him. And, and, and when he baptizes him, what happens? He sees something. He sees the heavens opened. Okay? And the Spirit of God descending upon Jesus like a dove. He hears something. He hears the voice out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is an amazing, powerful moment, all right? I'm sure that John has goosebumps at that point. It's kind of like, I can't believe this is actually happening. You know, this is what I was talking about, but here he is, and we're experiencing it. It's wonderful, and it's powerful, okay? John chapter 1 reveals that the next day, Jesus sees, uh, John sees Jesus with his disciples, and, and he says something that nobody else, nobody else understood. Nobody else knew. Nobody else saw it. He says, behold the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. The disciples didn't believe he was the Lamb of God. Huh? No. No, that meant death. That meant death. Behold the Lamb of God. John was the only one who saw Jesus as the sacrificial lamb who had come to lay, a, to, to lay down his life for us. We sang about it this morning. But John was the only one that saw that. The disciples saw him as coming king, and they saw them uh, ruling with him. Huh? Golden chariots, you know, new clothing, new homes, everything's wonderful, glorious, you know. But John saw him as the lamb of God. Amazing, amazing 
Revelation. So Matthew 14 reveals to us that John confronts Herod and Herodias about their inappropriate relationship. Herodias was married to Herod's brother Philip, and uh, Herod and Herodias had this inappropriate relationship. And so John, John confronts that. Thousands of people had repented of their sin. I'm sure John assumed that that was going to happen again. He's on a roll. His expectation, you know, Herod and Herodias are going to repent. All is going to be wonderful. But as you know, that didn't happen. John ends up in prison. Not for a day, not for a week, but probably maybe up to seven months. He's in prison. And this horizontal experience shook John. This natural life experience that he didn't see coming, that he wasn't expecting, that he wasn't looking for, it was a horizontal two-by-four. Two Ever get by a, hit by a two-by-four you didn't see coming? That's, that's exactly what happened to John. He gets hit by this two-by-four, and, and it's kind of like, I can't believe this is happening. So, Luke chapter 7, what happens in Luke chapter 7? Well, let me read it to you. I'll turn to it. If I can, if I can get to it here. Okay, Luke chapter 7, verse 18. The disciples of John reported to John about all these things. What things? Well, you know, this is what happened. The centurion servant previously, uh, the centurion had come to Jesus saying, my servant is sick, you know, could you heal him? And, and, and Jesus said, yes, I'll come. And, and, and he said, no, 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 you don't need to come. Just, just speak the word. I'm a man in authority. Just speak the word and, and my servant will be healed. And that's exactly what happened. At, in the same period of time, the widow's son of of, of Nain is amazingly raised from the dead. Okay, so, so John's disciples are sharing these miracles with John who is now in prison. All right? And this is, this is, what, this is, what, uh, this, this is what John said. Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord saying, Are you the expected one? Or do we look for somebody else? And you're thinking, John, you've got to be kidding me. You, you heard the voice out of heaven. You saw the dove. You had amazing revelation where you said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What, what happened to all that? You, you know what happened to all that? It was the confusion of the horizontal. It was the confusion of life experience. And life experience confused him. He didn't see this coming. This was something that he wasn't looking for. And, and, and it caused him to lose sight of the vertical. It caused him to lose sight of the reality of who Jesus really was. It obscured his view of the reality of Jesus Christ. It was a stumbling block. Jesus spoke to him and basically said, don't, don't focus on the horizontal. Don't focus on these events that don't make any sense. Don't be offended because of me. The end of the story is not pretty for, for John the Baptist. There's a lot of mystery, isn't there, to life? There is. John the Baptist is beheaded as a young man. There's a story in Acts chapter 12 about Peter and John. I, I mean, uh, Peter and James. They were, they were both in prison. And, and, and Peter is marvelously delivered. We love that story. <laughs> the, the, the chains fall off. Uh, the prison door is open. Uh, Peter walks out. We say, hooray, wonderful, this is great, you know. But in the same story, James, the brother of John, 
the two sons of thunder, James was thrust to his sword and killed without explanation. It doesn't say, it doesn't tell us why. It doesn't say, well, well, you know, the reason James was, was killed and Peter was, is that James forgot his morning devotions. No. It doesn't say anything like that. Mystery. The mystery of life. We've all experienced it. I got a couple more minutes. Let me, let me, let me read you a story. This is Max Licato's story. I love this. The message of Easter is clear. The story's not over yet. We haven't heard the punchline. We haven't finished the battle. Don't be pre premature in your judgments or too final in your opinion. The judge hasn't returned and the jury isn't in. The story isn't over yet. All that needs to be said hasn't been said and all that will be seen hasn't been seen. That's good news. If your eyes have ever moistened at the newsreels of the hungry, remember, the story's not over yet. If you've ever been bewildered as you beheld pain triumph over peace, keep the Easter message in mind. The story's not over yet. If you've ever found your fist clenched in rage as you read of the atrocities at Auschwitz, I've got something to show you. If you st stood um, distraught as you hear stories of yet another hijacking, another serial murderer, another child beating, this is a verse I want you to consider. Or perhaps your feelings are more personal. Maybe the ugly moments in history and open wounds of our day have dared to leave your television screen, entered your house. Maybe you've buried a child whose body was broken by a reckless dr driver. Maybe your child never called you daddy. Maybe the one who promised to love you forever loved you for only as long as it was convenient. Maybe you've suffered per personally from the cruelties in the world. Maybe the shadow of the question mark has blackened your door. Maybe you've asked why. The rain on the, on, on the unjust, I can understand. But why the just? To suffer the consequences of my sin makes sense. But why should I pay for the sins of others? Why the innocent? Why the children? Why the pure? Why me? Hard questions. Necessary questions. Questions surfaced by a perplexing passage in Matthew. Is there any passage in Scripture bloodier than the killing of the children by the soldiers of Herod? Though not specifically described, its bloody footprints are left between the lines of these verses. When Herod realized he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. It's a grisly scene. Horses galloping. Mothers with small boys running and screaming. The flashing of weapons. The flow of innocent blood. The sudden stillness of tiny hands. Mothers clutching lifeless bodies to blood-soaked breasts. It's a scene of swords piercing the innocent. No justification, no explanation, just cruel carnage, a senseless slaughter. And during it all, a fat king sits on the throne less than 10 miles away, blind to the tears he is summoned, deaf to the anguish he is caused. Cause Herod drinks wine, the color of the blood he is spilling. The wail heard in Bethlehem echoes throughout the stars, a chorus of chaos refusing to be comforted, a thousand tears with one voice, a hundred hearts with one question, why? The composer of this chaos watches from a nearby mountain. With each flash of the sword, he claps. With each plunge of the dung, uh, da dagger, he gloats. Evil at its worst, blackness at its darkest. This madman sheds near no tears for the young dead. He is intent on one thing, killing the Christ before he leaves the cradle. And when the ravage is completed and the madman knows he's failed, he curses, swirls around, and returns to his pit. Thirty years later, the other moment for which Satan has waited arrives. He is repeating his drama of desolation. Once again, he is slaughtering the innocent. Once again, swords flash and feet scamper. Once again, a spineless king called Herod is a pawn in the play. Once again, there are tears of a mother who wonders why. Once again, flesh is torn. Once again, there are cries of anguish. Once again, Satan is trying to kill life itself. This time, he has him where he wants him. God on a cross, the one who escaped him in Bethlehem,
is bolted to a tree. Satan applauds as his skin is ripped. This time you won't get away. A spear breaks through Jesus' ribs. Once again, the, ink, the, the innocent is pierced. I have done it, the madman dances amidst the demons. I have won, but the claim is premature for the crucified one who descends the spiral stairway into the cavern of death is not a defeated Messiah, and he has not come to surrender. Far from it. He is a creator, and he has come to reclaim his own. He has come to storm the gates of death. He scatters demons and rips open prison doors. He takes captivity captive and frees the faithful. You can be sure of one thing. Among the voices that sing his welcome are his Bethlehem brothers. They died that he might escape. He has now died that they might escape. They died that he might live, and now he's returned to return the favor. The Easter announcement is clear. Victory is secure. Wales of Bethlehem will turn into the victory of Calvary. Don't forget it. The next time the soldiers of Satan steal the joy from your arms, the next time your, your prayers seem to float into a silent sky, the next time you wonder how God could sit still while the innocent suffer, remember the story's not over yet. Remember the Easter Jesus rescued and imprisoned, and remember he is coming to do it again. Amen. What is that? Hope. It's exactly right. It's hope. It's vertical, not just horizontal. So we live in these two realms. John the Baptist lived in two realms. The horizontal, which was confusing, but also the vertical. And by the way, Jesus, when he refers to John the Baptist, after John brings the question, he affirms John's going to be okay. And he was. Absolutely sure of that. But we all experience the reality of the horizontal and the vertical. That's why every day, every day, every day, you need to renew yourself. Every day, every day, you need to remind yourself that you're living not only in a horizontal world, but a vertical world. In the horizontal world, there's a lot of confusion. My dad died, was a pastor. He died at 33 years of age when I was four years of age. I still don't know why. But it's okay. Mystery. There's a lot of mystery to life. There's a lot of things that we don't understand. But you have choices. I have choices. What are you going to do when the horizontal doesn't make sense? What are you going to do when life doesn't seem to be going the way that you think it should be going? Well, you can choose to either cave in to fear and depression and denial, or you can choose to say, I live horizontally, but I also live vertically. And one day, all of this is going to make sense, even though it might not make sense right now. Let me close with this story. A good friend of mine's name was George Stormont. George Stormont pastored in England uh, for some 60 years, some of the largest churches in England. I didn't know him when he was pastoring. I knew him when he was retired. He'd moved to the U.S. because his, his adopted da daughter and son uh, had, had moved to the U.S., and so they decided to retire in the U.S. I was pastoring up by Duluth, Minnesota at the time, and he and I became very, very close friends. And uh, we, we left that area, went back to Seattle, the pastor of my home church in Seattle. And uh, his, his wife, Ruth, called me up one day. I knew that, that George had, had experienced Parkinson's. And, and, and uh, she called me one day and she said, I had to put him in the rest home. I don't think he's going to make it. I, I, I'd love to have you come out to see George before he dies. So Colleen and I flew out to see him. He wasn't at home. He was in the rest home at the time. And, and um, so we went to the rest home, picked up Ruth at their home, went to the rest home, and, and he wasn't in his room. He was down in the cafeteria. So we went down to the cafeteria. It was a big room just like this. And, and, and he was at the end of the room facing the other direction, didn't know we were coming, and, and there was, there w he was sitting in a wheelchair, he was this big guy, probably, probably about six foot two, always had, his hair was always neat, always dressed really sharp, had this deep baritone voice that sounded like the voice of God in movies, you know, 
And, 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 and that was George Sermon. And, and a great sense of humor, wonderful sense of humor. So, uh, and, and a great friend to me. Um, and so, so he's, he's wearing one of these hospital gowns, you know, and beautiful hospital gowns, right? And, and, and he's sitting in a wheelchair, and, and now, now he can't even feed himself, can't take care of himself, can't feed himself, nothing. He's sitting in this wheelchair, and he's sitting there, and, and, and his head's vibrating because of the, of the Parkinson's. And, 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 and I, I, I came down beside him, and I, I kneeled beside him, and his head's kind of banging on my head. And I said, hi, George, it's Dave. And he, he turns and looks at me. The first thing he does is he tells me a joke. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I couldn't even laugh because it, it just, you know, it was such a horrible scene for me. Then he whispered in my, my ear and he said, Dave, everything in my life has been stripped away. And all I have is God. I knew what, his, what he meant, his independence. He preached all over the world. Preached to thousands and thousands of people. Raised millions of dollars for missions. Amazing guy. Did, did a lot more than I'd ever think. All of my life has been stripped away. And all I have is God. And then he took his wheelchair. And now he's not looking at me anymore. Now he's looking straight ahead. And he's, his whole body's vibrating because of the Parkinson's. But I'll never forget this. <laughs> and all of a sudden... He's no longer whispering. Now he's in full or preaching voice. And he says, And I have found that God is enough. And he goes, Ah. <laughs> he didn't die that day. Just a matter of weeks later, and I came back and administrated his funeral. How could George Stormont say that? Because he lived in two realms. He lived in the horizontal he wasn't denying the reality of his condition, but he also lived in the vertical. <laughs> all my life, all my horizontal is no longer there. All I have is God. And I have found that God is enough. And if it's true for George Stormont, it's true for you. It's true for me. Well, we renew ourselves every day. And while we look, Scopio, not on the things that are seen, the horizontal, but the things that are not seen, the vertical. Because the things that are seen are temporary. And things that are not seen are eternal. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this body of believers today. None of us knows what tomorrow holds in the horizontal. <laughs> but I thank you that our vertical is secure. <laughs> our relationship to you is secure and we reaffirm that we are going to live not only for the horizontal, but we are going to live every day focusing on the vertical. We thank you, Lord, that even when things happen in the horizontal that make no sense to us, like Elizabeth Elliot said, we, we can, that true faith is operative in the dark. We can trust you when we don't understand because we have you, and you have us, and our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, and heaven is going to be our home, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. I pray, God, that you will bless these people, and that you will keep them, and that you will make your face shine upon them. And that you will give them your peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Pastor just asked me to, to dismiss you, so you're free to go. <laughs> God bless you. Come back at 11.
11, 